Well, it's a real honor to be here, and you can see that the organizers really thought of everything, so uh, including a, a taller microphone for me. So thank you so much. And I thought the um, uh, initial presentations were just excellent, and uh, I think of myself as trying to add on to the profound insight of insights of Dr. Yoon and uh, Professor Landy uh, from earlier today. So I want to describe today's talk. I've got a translation uh, of my Black Box Society up on this first slide. And the direction I want to take the talk is in the idea that we can navigate both the benefits and risks of these algorithms, but it's going to take a lot of knowledge of the past. I start with respect to some of the works uh, that have been critiquing algorithms and key works in algorithmic accountability. I think there are many uh, compelling critiques of computation in social settings. Now, in terms of thinking about today's theme, I really want you to think of today's theme not as, when I propose regulation, not as trying to shut things down, but really as a matter of quality improvement, that we can um, bring, come together as citizens, as governmental officials, as AI researchers, lawyers, social scientists, others, to bring together regulations that promote further scientific progress and that try to make generative AI safe for the world and a more compelling value proposition for its users. That's going to involve a lot of democratization and a lot of bringing in domain expertise. And I feel particularly happy to have spent about five years writing a book called New Laws of Robotics, uh, Reclaiming Human Expertise in the Age of AI, because this is all about, the, my last book was all about these types of issues. Um, its Korean translation is coming out, I think, in a year or so. Um, in terms of the existing risks, one thing I want us to think about just to introduce the issues here is the existing risks from algorithms of ranking and rating. That data can be inaccurate when used in a financial algorithm. That the data could be inappropriate, for example, using someone's health status to decide whether to give them care or not, or to give them finance uh, or not. And that there can be secret data, and that that secrecy itself can keep us from finding out about the other problems. Algorithm level harms, right? There are problems of unfair algorithms. And I look here at social media, where, for example, Facebook at one point weighted the angry face emoji five times more than a like emoji, right? And that itself helped instigate a lot of anger online, right? Because if you're being rewarded for getting people angry, it's just this tool for getting more anger into society. <music> would often be a white male versus image of a cleaner, would often be a minority female, right? And these sorts of biases, if you think about chat GPTs or other generative AI as potentially being an oracle giving people answers, I won't map these particular questions to the rows, but each row was generated by asking a question like, show me a terrorist, show me a beautiful person, show me a poor person, show me a thug, right? And I can just attest to the fact that the rows about positive images were often of um, white individuals, the uh, ones of negative images were often non-white. So this again was a very problematic issue with respect to this type of system. And this Bloomberg study just came out and I think it's a really strong documentation of the problem. I think also on the algorithm level, there are the same sorts of problems that we saw with respect to the forms of um, uh, algorithmic accountability that I brought up earlier. So for example, there may be unfair or socially undesirable weighting of some aspects of the training set. So again, we're getting into this idea of the images of the world in these chatbots. And I always come back to this wonderful quote from uh, the novelist Iris Murdoch, who said that uh, humans are the creatures who create pictures of the world and then become the picture. Okay? And I think we have to really think about this. These are technologies are creating pictures of the world that we increasingly must interact with, involve ourselves with, know, our, know about, et cetera. And how are they influencing us? And the eight areas I'll go through, I promise I'll go through quickly, um, are copyright infringement, defamation, disinformation, premature disruption, spam, thought displacement, feedback loops, and counterfeit people. Let's start this up. First, copyright infringement. And I divide the copyright question into two phases, right? The learning phase, where the neural nets are trying to learn from a data set, and the 
uh, a production phase. Now, the learning phase, at least in the US, a lot of people felt that this was very safe, right? Very smart scholars like Matt Sag, Emery, others have written uh, uh, very convincing pieces to many about the need to allow robotic reading, right? What James Grillman calls the robot reading of texts, automatic reading of texts. And it's the sort of thing that allows the functionality of Google Books, right? Which I think is vastly functional, very useful for many. But as professors Mark Lemley uh, and Brian Casey of Stanford have pointed out, um, there's lots of pushback now. Um, there was a case recently called TV Eyes, where people tried to develop and TV what Google developed for books, and they were stopped. The court said, wait a second, you should license that information. You don't get to just copy it all, you should license it, get permission, give some forms of control, compensation, and credit to those to whom you're using this info. That has in turn led to the hashtag create don't scrape movement, right? Lots of people who are very upset about the way that their art, design, images are being used in training sets. Uh, John Lamb, uh, I think, is one of the leading uh, figures in this movement. Um, I do recommend his Twitter feed for sort of keeping up with the latest of lawsuits and uh, other resistance by artists. And um, he put very provocatively, if you need to feed art from the middle class to poverty, from poverty to poverty stricken artists without consent through a machine made by literal millionaires, you aren't democratizing, you're not Robin Hood, right? And this, I think, is quite a strong pushback against some of the narratives here, right? I also know that with respect to the production phase, there are other images, other issues here. For example, sometime the AI NIR art generator can leave in obvious aspects of work that it has effectively collaged in. And there's lots of protection for collage in copyright law, but there may also be suspect appropriation. Well, how might that happen, right? And these, these examples are examples where the, the image of the signature of the artist shows up in some way in what's produced by the generative AI. Well, one issue comes up with respect to, say, copyright ownership indications. So at least under US copyright law, if someone puts something called copyright management information on their picture, saying who created it, who copyrighted, et cetera, you're not permitted to take that off. And yet part of the business model can be to take it off, or as you see from this example, a, a very um, a botched example of trying to create an image of a white horse um, it's left on, but in a mangled way. So that's been the, pro the uh, basis of things like the class action filed with respect to uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act violations, other violations, et cetera. I'd also note that there might be substantial similarity. So on the left of this side, you see an image by Greg Rutkowski called Dragon Cage, right? And this is a sorcerer trying to create a fire to dra cage the dragon, right? Now, on the right side, you have the prompt, dragon battle with a man at night in the style of Greg Rukowski. So the question then becomes, I mean, should we allow generative AI to take to, to people to ask generative AI, you know, rather than paying Greg Rukowski for his image, could you just scoop up all his images and then give me something that's generally in his style, right? And in general, copyright law is very worried about protecting style. It's about protecting works, but not necessarily styles. But sometimes that's really hard to figure out. So one of the cases that may be important to how we decide whether the images on the right or images that are more like it are copyright infringement could be this case called Steinberg versus Columbia Pictures. Here's the original. Here's an image of the New Yorker, right? A cover showing a map of New York. This is called the New Yorker's view of the world. Um, I should say as a Brooklynite, this is the Manhattan's view of the world. It's not looking at my, where I am in Brooklyn. But in any event, this is the New Yorker's view of the world. Um, and here's a movie poster that came out. And it's an interesting question, right? Because you might say, well, it's only a bit of it. And you know, here's like, um, and here's the original, right? The original is here. This is the, was what was called inspired by it. But there's a lot of similarities. Like you see, the type is kind of similar. The style of building is kind of similar. The other things are similar. You know, so when thinking about this uh, comparison, the judge said it would be, would be appropriate or it would be permissible for a jury to find copyright infringement here because there's so much of a copying of the style. And I think if that sort of case comes back, you know, the, the generative AI will have to worry about these types of 
scenarios. Now, moving on, um, and just very briefly to give you a piece of the state of the art in law right now, um, the scholar uh, Peter Henderson um, at Stanford again and others have said that there's a caveat with respect to fair use. If a model produces output that is similar to copyrighted data, particularly in scenarios that affect the market of that data, fair use may no longer apply to the output of the model. So that this could really shut down a lot that's going on, right? If they take copyright very seriously, these types of conclusions could lead to a whole flurry of litigation where we have to figure out how we give control compensation and credit to others. Mm -hmm.